I went. <laughs> I went to see the gypsy, staying in a big hotel. He smiled when he saw me coming, and he wished me well. His room was dark and crowded. The lights were low and dim. How are you? He asked me, and I said it back to him. I went down to the lobby to make a small call out. A pretty dancing girl was there, and she began to shout. Go on back to see the gypsy. He can rid you of your fear. He did it in Las Vegas, and he can do it here. Good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday. The rain has come. The rains have finally come. The monsoon is here. The skies are dark and cloudy. But I'm awake and I've been up since 5.30 and I'm jazzed on coffee. And I brought a few of my, not my favorite books, but just a stack of books into the into the office with me just so I can have five books stacked up just piled up so I can see the spines and feel inspired by them I'm reading way too many books right now I'm in the middle of like three or four novels so this week I really should buckle down and just start finishing them I think I kind of I stockpile finishes sometimes I <laughs> I'll get a bunch of whatever what am I talking about my reading habits I found a a new Jim Butcher book that I didn't know that I had, and this one is way advanced in the series, and I just read the first chapter, and it was interesting to see how much they'd they'd changed over the years. But there's another book that I picked up that actually, it's a, I guess it's a philosophical, it's a fun sort of autobiographical philosophy novel by this uh, modern-day philosopher, He's French, so I'll butcher his name. It looks, if you're American, you just read Alain de Botton, but I think it's more like Alain de Botton. Anyways, uh, he has a lot of books, but this one's called The Art of Travel. And my favorite thing about this book, or what's interesting, is it's just a fun premise. It's just a fun um, project, the way that it's structured. So I'm looking at it right now, and there are... One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so there's five sections. And the book is about travel. It's it's the philosophy of travel. Well, it's called the art of travel. I guess it's a study in art more than it is a study in philosophy, but I think he is talking about both. Anyways, uh, it's fun how it's... Ch- I've just never seen another book that did this. So there's five sections departure, motives, landscape, art, return. So he uses the five sections to sort of go over the uh, the arc of a trip. First you leave, talking about the motives, the things you see there, what you experience, and then returning and coming back home. And then in each section, so the first one, which is about anticipation, so this is even before the departure starts, so it's fun. He's taking you through the different journeys of uh, the different feelings and stages of a trip. So for every given chapter, there's a place and then there's a guide. So the first place is Hammersmith, London and Barbados. And then the guide is J.K. Husmans. Husmans. I'm showing my ignorance here because I don't know who this artist is. But anyways, the point is that Every chapter, he will talk about a certain idea, and then he'll intersperse that chapter with his own autobiographical writing. So he's telling the story of this time I went somewhere with my wife, or I did this trip. And then he uses his guide, his artistic guide or philosophical guide. He tells the story of that person's life. So let me 
Okay, so here's a good example. This is the one I was reading this morning. So chapter 7 is called On Eye-Opening Art, and the place is Provence, so southern France, and the guide is Vincent van Gogh. The author, Alain de Botton, he is reading from his diaries, or he's recounting an experience where he went to Provence. So he went there. So he that's what's the autobiographical feature of this philosophical work or artistic work is what I think is fun and interesting and makes it way more fun to read than um, just a study of philosophy. So he actually went to Provence and he stayed at a hotel there and he went there because it was this place where Vincent Van Gogh, Van Gogh, right? Yeah, Van Gogh where Van Gogh went and produced some of his best work, which I didn't know this off the top of my head, but um, looking at it now, I remember seeing these kind of uh, paintings before in textbooks or whatever. So Van Gogh is painting the southern France uh, landscape, and you're seeing cypress trees and wheat fields and olive trees. And so what's fun about the structure of the book is that the writer will write a chapter about his experience in Provence, and then the next scene, they're short scenes, so he'll tell a scene about him arriving in Provence and being disappointed because it doesn't look as beautiful as he imagined. And then the next scene is he's ta- the next chapter he's talking about Vincent Van Gogh's life. So why did Van Gogh come there, and what did he write in his journals to his brother when he went there, and actually looking at Van Gogh's life and hearing in his words what he loved about Provence and how much he painted there and uh, how uh, what he felt as he was painting. So I don't know much about the writer Alain, Alain de Botton. I know he's been on TV a lot. He's a, sort of a popular, which I think he's interesting for no other, if for no other reason than just to have sort of like a modern day popular philosopher is interesting someone who's on tv and talking about philosophy and who's sort of a media figure but i just never seen a book that was structured quite like this and i thought it was fun it's called the art of travel and it's i have this like short it's a sturdy paperback it's kind of heavy but otherwise it's perfect for it's just fun to read uh, while you're on a trip because all the insights are about travel. And that's when I bought it on some other, I bought it years ago on some other trip and I've just read chapters here and there. And today I just picked it up and read another chapter, but there's a lot of good ones. There's one on a bottle air. I remember that one was good. There's one on, um, Gustave Flaubert and the Flaubert and the place is Amsterdam and the one that I read today, which I already told you about, was Van Gogh in um, Provence. So here's my biggest takeaway from the chapter on Van Gogh, or the thing that um, was relevant to me anyways. I was just reading this and taking notes right before I uh, hit record. Uh, let me just read this, uh, this quick paragraph from, uh, from the book. Later, explaining to his brother why he had moved from Paris to Arles, Van Gogh offered two reasons. Because he had wanted to, quote-unquote, paint the South, and because he had wanted, through his work, to help other people to see it. However unsure he was of his own powers to do this, he never wavered in his faith that the project was theoretically possible. That is, that artists could paint a portion of the world and in consequence open the eyes of others to see it. So Van Gogh is, you know, he's, he's a badass. He's an artist, artist. There's the whole ear thing. And just reading about this book, uh, just hearing what he did, where he go, he's, you know, he's has all the marks of an artist. He's poor. He's living with his brother. Uh, he's 35 when he moves down here to uh, southern France and he doesn't have anything going for him but he's trying to paint and um, I guess he just had a crazy productive time during this it was around 1889 produce approximately 200 paintings 100 drawings and 200 letters 
that's fucking awesome, dude. I just don't know how anybody could do that these days with, uh, with the internet and TV and all the distractions that we had. It's such a crazy thought to think of like moving somewhere remote and, uh, you know, if you had no technology or no other distractions and then just going into super creative, productive mode, it's not hard. Like the little that I've done with writing and, uh, podcasting or any sort of creative pursuit, you quickly learn that it's not as romantic as it sounds. Like it's not being that pr- it's easy to go and like have ambitions of being artists and to th- say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this, but to actually be productive and to actually be making all those things is really hard. It, it hurts physically. It hurts mentally. Mostly it takes a mental focus that most people don't have. And that's, what's amazing about what Van Gogh was doing. So I love, it's always just a, you know, a romantic idea to me. I've always wanted to do something like that. And, and I've always liked those short periods of time in my life when I've been able to sort of channel a lot of productivity. But so what's interesting to me about Van Gogh's thought process was he, he, first of all, he acknowledges that there is a certain truth to us, to all places. So there's a beauty that you can find wherever you go. And for him, the world was mostly consists of France uh, because the world was smaller back then. It wasn't so easy to uh, just country hop and go all around the world. So it was a it was a big journey for him to go from Paris uh, down to southern France and to be in the province, the provincial area, the countryside. And he felt that there was a truth there that there was a reality that could be painted so even if he didn't know it even if he wasn't sure that he could do it that he was the one to bring it to life he was sure that it it could be done that was his belief and actually it in the book it talks about how he there had been other french artists well i think van gogh was not french actually he was from holland i think but there have been other artists who had painted the province and not done it well so van gogh not only did he think that it could be done right he he thought that because other people had painted this area and he thought they hadn't done it justice one thing that i am always coming back to when i'm writing or thinking about writing or working on my stories is just tell the truth just get back to the truth because it's so easy when you're writing to start to pander to what you think you should do or what other people have done or what you think is good for your genre or what you think other people would like you to do. You start hearing your your uh, mom's voice in your head and your sister's voice in your head and your best friend's voice in your head and your childhood teacher and preacher's voice in your head and those, all those things are not in and of themselves bad influences, but when you're creating, they are because when you're creating the best thing you can do is express what you think is true or what you see, just like Van Gogh was trying to do. He was trying to be true to the landscape in front of him and show exactly what he was seeing and feeling. And so if he was, let, if he was letting himself be influenced by what other painters had already done in that area, he wouldn't have created anything that was half as good as what he did. One of the hardest things about being a creative is feeling like you don't have anything original to say. This is, I'm pretty sure all writers deal with this self-doubt, whether they're Uh, successful or not or prolific or not or talented or not or whatever the hell they are I think everyone has that same feeling of well how can I say anything that hasn't been said before it's all been done under the sun and what's I think the only way to combat that the only solace 
you can take and the only sword you can fight that insecurity with is the idea that just that you're unique. That's like every, every creative's hidden superpower, which is brilliant. And, and I think we should teach young kids this. And I think good parents do teach their kids. This is just that you are special and not by anything, not because of anything you did, not uh, because you had to earn it or not because it was given to you, just that you are special, that there is something about you that is a little, a little bit different than, um, than anyone else in the world. And to bring it back to the anal- analogy with a Van Gogh trying to just paint what he saw, no matter how similar you are to all your friends or to people around you, you're still, uh, every creative person is still unique and you're just a little bit different. And no matter how bland or boring you think your thoughts are, they're a little bit different. And if you really, that's a hard part is to get out of your own way and to, and to actually say what you think is true rather than, uh, watering down your thoughts and ideas based on what you think other people will think that's the hardest part. It sounds, sounds so easy, but I think all, all good things are like that. All real truths are like that. Like if you want to be healthy or if you want to lose weight, uh, just do two things, you know, be active and, and don't take in more calories than you burn. It's just, I don't know. There's no, there's, there's a million (laughs) variations and ways to do that, but it really all comes down to those truths and with writing and being creative it sounds so so simple and and no nonsense it it sounds like too easy to be true just to say be yourself be yourself don't be anybody else and uh the truth is that's a really hard part and that's why i love um when you see people who are actually able to achieve that the that's (laughs) this that's the i can't think any I can't think of any um, more high society way to put it, but that's the bitch of the whole creative endeavor is when you look at somebody like Bob Dylan, who was actually able to be himself, then the funny thing about that is people are drawn to it. People love it. People want to follow him. But um, when artists are insecure, that's the funny thing is that what they want is to get what Bob Dylan have has had, which is uh, adoration and respect for their work. That's what insecure artists want. But the only way they can get that is if they can just be themselves. But as they're trying to get what they want, they're trying to be like other people. And so they're, they're, turning the whole process on its head. And I think everyone does that. We all do that in little ways. Uh, some of us in greater ways, some of us in smaller ways, but to me, that's, it's so kind of mind mind numbingly simple, but also mind numbingly difficult. That process of, uh, just making something and saying the truth and not letting anyone else dictate what you say. I guess if I were to keep extrapolate extrapolating out this idea then you would get to the point where you could say that you know all to be an artist you have to be secure in yourself maybe there's some kind of truth to that idea that to create something you it has to come from somewhere to say something you have it's like to say something you have to know what you want to say uh, to do something, you have to set out a goal in the first place. So to write a novel takes some sort of um, security. It has to come from a foundation of personal concreteness, knowing who you are and knowing what's important to you and knowing what you like. And so if you think about it that way, that in order to make something you have to be secure in yourself. That's so, uh, it makes sense why it's so hard to share your work uh, because a lot of people and I, this is what I did when I was young. I love to write, but I would just scribble 
in journals all the time, and I couldn't imagine ever sharing it with anyone else. Uh, and that was just because I wasn't secure in who I was. I wasn't sure that what I was saying was uh, legal. I wasn't sure it was socially acceptable. I wasn't sure it was cool. And so, you know, I was worried of what other people would think of me if I if I shared my writing or my song that I had written or, uh, you know, it, it makes sense to me that everyone has those sort of creative, creative needs, the need to get something out there, the, that impulse to write what you're feeling or to sing it in a song or to dance or (laughs) whatever, whatever people do, however you express yourself. And, uh, that's why it's really hard to be an artist is because, uh, first of all, you have to get vulnerable enough to say something that's real. So that's a very profound process. Even, um, just doing that in and of itself, that can be hard. A lot of people might not even be able to get to that point. And then all artists, I think, do better and better at learning how to get to that point, how to channel that energy. So first of all, you have to be vulnerable enough to even let yourself say what you really think. And then you have to take the next giant leap, which is to take that thing, which was precious, which was vulnerable, which you would only say underneath the sheets with the lights off. And then to blast that out and to the world for anyone and everyone and all of your worst uh, nightmares, you know, all the people that you imagine who are judging you, who probably aren't and are probably don't care and who probably are all just too busy uh, living their own lives and trying to get by. But that's not what's not important is what they really think. What's important is how you perceive them and how insecure you are about it. So then you have to take that thing and broadcast it out into the world. And that's why everyone doesn't write a novel. That's why everyone is not uh, a creative. That's why everyone is not publishing their work all the time. Is because that is a scary process. And that's why it's hard. And that's why it's so beautiful when you see someone who has done it well. I'm excited to work on my story this week. I'm feeling good today because I have a few days off for a vacation. It's a weird, it's not really a week. Like I get a couple, basically I have two half weeks um, off of work. And for me, that is exciting because it gives me the space to clear my head. I've always resisted. I've, I've, I've never liked the idea that um, my job, my day job could um, how can I say this? I get pissed off whenever I realize that my day job is intruding in the hours of my life where I'm not at work. So like the other night I was dreaming about work and then I woke up and I was thinking about work and then I was pissed off (laughs) because I feel like I should be like, I, I've always felt this way that I, okay, I'll give eight hours a day or 40 hours a week or whatever it is to my day job. And I don't want to give any more because I'm not getting paid to give any more. And not just that, but also I want to be doing other things in those hours when I'm not there. And what I find, what to me, the sort of mental blockage that builds up when you've been working too long and you need a vacation is that you're just in that cycle so much that you can't stop thinking about work. Like you can't imagine any other life outside of that. And so I love, uh, even though this is a short kind of measly vacation that I have coming up, it's still really refreshing. And that, you know, the day after the first day, I'm still kind of thinking about work. The second day I maybe think about a little, and then maybe, you know, it takes a few days to get there. And then finally, you're finally it's totally out of your mind and you are cleansed (laughs) i guess that shows you what i i guess that shows my disdain for uh day jobs and that i would think of it as a cleansing or some sort of 
getting out from under some sort of <laughs> sickness. <laughs> but I'm excited because today's Wednesday and it's actually my Friday because uh, it's my last day of work. And so I have that feeling like, um, you know, nothing can touch me. Like I don't really care what happens today. I woke up at 5.30, but I didn't care because I'm not worried about, you know, I can be tired for one day and, you know, make it up another time. And so I feel feel kind of invincible today. And I think that's why I was singing at the beginning of the podcast because I just thought, well, why the hell not? This is my podcast. So I don't know. It sounded good to me like doing it and I do have fun. And there was something weird that happened where I put the mic I turned the mic on this morning and uh, it just sort of reminded me of all those times when I used to just record guitar songs. So maybe I need to start start um, writing songs again. Maybe that's what the universe is trying to tell me. But I've also been listening to that Bob Dylan album, the, the Bootleg series. Which one is my, my all-time favorite um, bootleg Bob Dylan? You know, you know, the best albums are... Uh, you know, Blood on the Tracks and uh, Highway 61 and Blonde on Blonde. Those are the best studio albums, but I think the Bob Dylan that inspires me the most or like hits me in the gut the most are all the bootleg albums. Uh, the ones where they're sort of simple recordings or rough, rough recordings. I love, I love that stuff when you can hear people laughing in the background or when he fucks up a, a lyric and then he has to go back and restart it. Um, I like that kind of musical production. There's something beautiful about that. That's more real to me than a, um, a studio version, like a radio hit heavily produced song that you hear on the radio. But, uh, I'm trying to look at it now. Oh, it's called the bootleg series volume 10. That's the uh, that's my favorite one, and the first song is called "Went to See the Gypsy," and I think he wrote it. You never know; it's hard to know with these things. But what's really fun on this album, the first song is that "Went to See the Gypsy," and then later on in the album, you can hear him playing the same song, but I think it's on piano, and so there's a totally different um, what do you call it? The speed of the song. The tempo is totally different. And so the way he phrases the lyrics are totally different. And also he's playing the piano instead of the guitar. And I love when you get to hear that because you 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 hear it in a new light. You see it in a, in a new form. It's like seeing a friend that you know and suddenly they have on a different work uniform or they dye their hair a different color and suddenly you're like, oh, it what is it that's happening? It's like something on the periphery is changing. So you become more aware of what the heart of the thing is. If that makes sense. This is going to sound silly, but if it's like, if you have a regular hamburger and then you change it and then you take off the bun and you put on a potato bun or a sourdough bun even though the bun is what's changed because the bun is what's changing. It's like the meat of the burger is what you notice and appreciate more. Cause that's the thing that stayed consistent. That's what I love about hearing songs that are covered by other artists because, um, you like, what's a good example, like all along the watchtower, which, um, Bob Dylan did, but then Jimi Hendrix really made that song go. When you hear the two different, versions of the same song it's like it's a sort of like you're tossing around the ingredients in the bowl and everything's sifting out and then you're finding out you know like you're sifting through through the gold pan until you find what's really the the power of that song and i think anyone would say that Jimi hendrix found the power of that song better than bob dylan did and it's not just not just because he played it louder or more rock and roll, it's because that was the way that that song could best uh, express itself. So anyways, on this Bob Dylan bootleg album, the, that song, I Went to See the Gypsy, 
it's uh you get to hear it in a couple different versions and it really makes me appreciate that song and i just fucking love those lyrics and i think that's it's just been in my head all week and um it also reminds me of um a couple summers ago in alaska because i would always listen to that song in the morning when i would go out and um walk around in the forest and for me it's always the lyrics of the song that are important i always have because i'm not really a musician i don't um appreciate the the architecture of the music or the sound or the tone or the melody as much as a musician would i appreciate it just like any regular human being loves the feeling the emotion that they get from music but for me it's always the lyrics that i'm interested in uh, it's always like you know music is just a better way to get your better way to say your poems it's a good background for uh t- for writing your poems and so i don't like listening to instrumental songs even though i understand that they have a beauty and other people um love them for different reasons but for me it's always the lyrics that are most important and it's so interesting it's like when i heard the song played in two different versions with different instruments the lyrics stuck out to me even more and uh, made sense to me in a way that they hadn't before okay i just took a break to go and refill my coffee mug and as i did that i made a decision that the theme of this episode theme of this podcast episode is uh being an artist a true artist like vincent van gogh and uh, it's my dream and it's my romantic fantasy and maybe it's just a fantasy but uh i'm excited about uh, having a few days off of work and the idea you know i'm just just all fired up to throw my phone into the sea and uh I won't throw my computer into the sea because it's too expensive. My phone's shitty, so if I lose that, no, no big deal. But uh, you know, my laptop, I'll, I'll put it in a safe cabinet or something <laughs> where I can't feel it looking at me, and uh, shut myself up in a room and uh, just read and write. And just the feeling of getting these books down and bringing them into the office this morning has got me excited. And uh, so while I was getting my coffee, I, I realized that's the theme of what I'm talking today, of what I'm talking about today is that uh, I've always loved that feeling. You know, the first day of a trip is always the best to me because that's when everything is possibility. That's when everything is anticipation. That's when everything hasn't yet happened. Obviously, the saddest day is the last day when everything's done and you realize it's all past. Um, but those first couple days are the most exciting. And so I'm paying homage to Van Gogh today, who was a true artist in the artist artist sense of the word, who uh, was starved and devoted to the cause and um, devoted to the brilliance and the beauty and who created something that with that has withstood the the test of time. And that's every artistry or we'll always we we'll always like that idea that trope that archetype you know there's the hero there's a quintessential hero there's a quintessential villain there's the um coming of age story there's the love story the romance story that's tried and true and timeless and then there's also the starving artist myth that's tried and true and timeless we'll always ever we'll always uh, romanticize that and uh, Van Gogh is certainly a good representation of that. Anyways, that's the theme of this episode. Now uh, it all makes sense to me, and I thought it would be fun just to share. I, I picked these books at random, but it seems like someone or something was guiding my hand because uh, I found a connection. That's just what the nerd in me does. The nerd, the, sometimes I feel like I'm a better editor than writer because I don't like 
it's much more of a painstaking process for me to create something new and much more of a it's much more of a fun interesting process for me to get into a first draft get into something that's already been written and reshape it rework it uh move it around move the pieces around focus that thing um so i'm always looking at the threads i'm always looking at what what i'm always making associations between uh ideas uh, between different stories i've heard and trying to bring them all together and make i'm always trying to make trying to find some cohesion so with all these books i found at random uh i found a little bit of that another random one i got this is from john muir i used to live in california uh I propose to my wife in Yosemite and uh, I've been to Yosemite a few times. Anyways, I used to love reading John Muir and I still have some of his books. But wouldn't you know, when I opened this book, this one is called My First Summer in the Sierra. And when I opened this book, uh, one of the dog-eared pages, I think this is really fun to do and I get, I'm sure I'll book nerds will agree with me i like to just pull books down that i've already read and find uh, the the dog-eared pages and then see what i thought was interesting in that book when i read it a long time ago and so when i picked up this my first summer in the sierra i just flipped through it to a few things that i had marked when i actually read the book and i found this um chapter where wouldn't you know john muir is talking about being an artist (laughs) so he's sitting in yosemite a long time ago when it wasn't the tourist uh tourist throb that it is now and he's sitting there and he's one of the only people in the whole valley and he's just looking at things and having ideas and again doing the the true artist the pure thing uh, like van gogh is doing here's what john muir said ahem Sketching on the North Dome, it commands views of nearly all the valley besides a few of the high mountains. I would fain draw everything in sight, rock, tree, and leaf, but little can I do beyond mere outlines, marks with meanings like words readable only to myself, yet I sharpen my pencils and work on as if others might possibly be benefited. It's funny, I was just reading Bukowski, Charles Bukowski poems before I read um, this uh, John Muir section. And John Muir is just so proper and gentlemanly and he doesn't have any sort of grit or base nature in his writing. Everything is proper and and pure with him. I, I love that line. Uh, yet I sharpen my pencils and work on as if others might possibly be benefited. I think you really hit on the artist's toil right there. It's like it's like he realizes. So first of all, he realizes how vain the project is or how impossible the project is. So he's sitting in front of what I think is one of the most, what many people think is one of the most beautiful scenes on planet earth is yosemite valley you got to put it up in in the top 100 at least which makes it fucking amazing and he's looking at this scene and he's realizing how futile it is how can i draw this how can i sketch this in a way that does it any sort of justice so first he has that he recognized the the futility of it all and then like a good artist like a good creative he says well screw it i'm gonna go i'm gonna keep trying i sharpen my pencils and work on as if others might possibly be benefited so as if it might be worth something to anybody at some time he's gonna keep working i thought that was an amazing uh expression and it's interesting that I liked that a long time ago and I still like it now. And then just to wrap that up. So he's still, I sk- I'm skimming through the pages and he's still, he's sitting there. He's talking about trying to sketch the, the Valley. And then he says this next, 
perch like a fly on this Yosemite dome, I gaze and sketch and bask, oftentimes settling down into dumb admiration without definite hope of ever learning much, yet with the longing, unresting effort that lies at the door of hope, humbly prostrate before the vast display of God's power and eager to offer self-denial and renunciation with blah, 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 blah. So I like that he captured that feeling of being so excited that you're just sort of speechless. Uh, He calls it dumb admiration. So he's sitting in front of the subject. I think this is uh, totally applicable to writers too. When you're when you're feeling something, when you're experiencing something, when you're imagining a great story and you just recognize how overwhelming it is to, to try and get it all out. And then you just, uh, admire beauty, I guess. Uh, John Muir was definitely an artist. He was a writer, obviously. Um, but he was a scientist and that makes him, a. Well, I don't know what that makes him, but I'll always love John Muir. And that's what you get on this podcast, you know? I don't know. You know, there's a lot of writing podcasts out there. There's a lot of uh, strange podcasts out there. But I doubt you're going to get Alain de Botton, Charles Bukowski, and John Muir on the same episode. All wrapped up. <laughs> we can argue about how tidally I've... I've uh, threaded all of these together, but, uh, all commenting, all those different artists commenting on what it is to be a true artist. So the one that I'm going to leave you with today, my, and my inspiration for, um, doing the real work this week is a poem by Charles Bukowski. And the title of the poem is I'm not all knowing, but dot, dot, dot. And this is from the book, Come On In, New Poems, which has a really colorful and fun cover. One of the problems is that when most people sit down to write a poem, they think, now I'm going to write a poem. And then they go on to write a poem that sounds like a poem or what they think a poem should sound like. This is one of their problems. Of course, there are other problems. Those writers of poems that sound like poems think then they must go around reading them to other people. This, they say, is done for status and recognition. They are careful not to mention vanity or the need for instantaneous approbation from some sparse idle crowd. The best poems, it seems to me, are written out of an ultimate need, and once the poem is written, the only need after that is to write another. And the silence of the printed page is the best response to a finished work. In decades past, I once warned some poet friends of mine about the masturbatory nature of poetry readings done just for the applause of a handful of idiots. Isolate yourself and do your work, and if you must mix, then do it with those who have no interest at all in what you consider so important. Such anger, such a self-righteous response did I receive them from my poet friends that it seemed to me that I had exactly proved my point. After that, we all drifted apart. And that solved just one of my problems, and I suppose just one of theirs. So there you have it, folks. The always grumpy, always antagonizing, always biting Charles Bukos. Bukowski. And that's why he's such a good poet is that he says the terrible, dirty things that uh, most people can't say. So there was two things. He said poet, and I think you can interchange the word poet with uh, artist or true artist or writer. He said that the two things that are wrong with the true artist is... uh, one, that they do these readings just for self-gratification. So that speaks to um, the egotistical side of um, doing a thing just to get response, doing a thing just to get applause or just to be acknowledged. I guess it's the it's the seeking after fame aspect of being an artist, right? It's 
uh, creating something so that you can become famous and that people will love you or, or not, not the act, but the, the desire, the motivation behind making something in order to become famous. That's one thing. But then the other thing that I think was more important or maybe just more fitting about what I've been talking about this morning is he says that the problem, just that opening line is, is so powerful. The problem with most poets is that they sit down to write a poem and then they write what they think a poem should be. And that speaks exactly to what I was talking about at the beginning of this episode, which is that the, the hardest thing is just to be yourself and to say the right thing. And the problem that everyone encounters is they sit down to write and then they let all these other influences come in and they think, oh, this is what my friend would want me to write and this is what my dad wouldn't want me to say and this is what other writers have done, so I should try to do that. And Bukowski is saying it's the same with poets is that they try to be too poetic. And I think that's obviously a, a bane of writers too is that they try to be too writerly. So what's the solution? The solution is just to be yourself and to say what you think is true, but that's also the hardest thing to do and much easier than it sounds. But I'm feeling jazzed up today and I'm feeling inspired to work on my stories over the week, uh, to play guitar, to think about work a little bit less, and just to do all of the things that put me in that zone. Definitely need to throw the phone into the ocean or somewhere, throw it somewhere and uh, focus this week. So I hope that happens and I'm excited to share with you. Here's my promise. Here's the thing that'll hold me accountable. I promise on next Wednesday's episode, after a week of having a little more free time, I will share something that I wrote in the Tomorrow City universe. I'll read you part of what I wrote. So it won't be finish it won't be from the book obviously but it'll be a rough draft or whatever a piece of a of a chapter that i've written so next week i'll share some of that with you and talk about my progress and i'll let you know how it went <laughs> uh trying to channel my best van gogh and uh and be prolific during a, a short even though it's a short period of time uh and i'm realistic about these things i know that the important the mature writer understands that, you know, a lot of people, it's a common mistake where people think I'm going to write a novel one day when I have time, you know, one day when I quit my job, one day when I'm on vacation, one day when my kids go off to college, whatever, but that never happens the way that a real novel gets written is you do a little bit every day and you have a writing habit. So I know I've been through this before where I've, I've told myself, you know, as soon as I have, as soon as I have time, I'm going to bust it out. And that never happens because you don't just, you can't just turn it on and off. You can't just write nothing for years and years and years and then suddenly be prolific. Not even days. You can't even, it's impossible even to not write for a couple of weeks and then think you're going to have a big outburst all of a sudden when you have time. You just can't do it. It's like running. Uh, that's the best analogy I can ever think of. It makes the most sense to me. Uh, you can't just not run for a few weeks and, and then think you're going to run 10 miles all of a sudden. Uh, maybe some people, if you're in good shape, you could bang out 10 miles, but you get the idea. So, all that to say, I'm realistic. I know I'm not going to write my whole novel in this week because I'm going to fill my time with other things. And also, I'm just going to keep writing at whatever writing shape I'm in now, which is I'm able to write uh, you know, a little bit each day, maybe a thousand words, maybe 3,000 words if I'm, uh, if I'm feeling good, not feeling good, but doing good. So uh, I'm realistic about it, but I'm also very excited and I'm going to use these guys, these giants in the genre to inspire me. And I hope that that inspires you too, uh, just to do the real work, whatever the real work is for you, whether that's being with the people you love 
or creating the thing that you want to create or even just being distracted a little less um, on your evenings or on your weekend or whatever it is. So go out into the world and be great artists, all of ye. Uh, Happy Wednesday, everyone. Be well, be inspired, be the best version of yourselves. As always, I will be back next week with more.